Dr. Paul Copan is the Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics at Palm Beach Atlantic University in West Palm Beach, Florida. He holds master's degrees in philosophy and divinity as well as a PhD in philosophy. His dissertation work was done on the atheism of Michael Martin and is entitled uh, The Moral Dimensions of Michael Martin's Atheology, a Critical Assessment. He formerly worked with the Ravi Zacharias Ministries. He has taught at a number of seminaries and divinity schools and is currently the president of the Evangelical Philosophical Society. He has authored or edited nearly 20 books, uh, his most recent of which is central to our symposium theme this year, The Problem of God, and the title of his recent book is this, Is God a Moral Monster Making Sense of the Old Testament God? A very important piece to have in your library. His lecture tonight, Is God a Moral Monster, Good, Evil, and the God of the Old Testament? will be followed by a Q&A time, so please hold your questions. We will invite you to the microphone in due time. And welcome with me, Dr. Paul Copan. Well, thanks for the warm welcome. It's good to be back in the Midwest. I was actually born in the Midwest, uh, born in Cleveland, Ohio, um, lived in the days when Cleveland Indians bleach receipts were 50 cents. So, uh, you know, can you imagine going to a doubleheader and paying 25 cents a game at a Cleveland Indians game? Those were the days. Of course, I never saw the Indians win any games when I was there. Uh, I had to, you know, I probably went to two dozen games. I lived so close to the stadium I could walk there. Uh, to Indians and Browns games. The Browns did a little better, uh, but uh, the Indians were always a heartbreak for me. I remember one time coming home from a game and I was just sobbing because the Indians had lost and my older sister was driving and she saw some kid along the shoreway uh, just you know, on a bridge and so she just stopped and found out it was her own brother crying uh, that the Indians had lost, so she drove me home and consoled me. <laughs> well, I'm not one for jumping into the fire uh, without having a lot of context, and this is a topic that is notoriously challenging to talk about because it does require more context than uh, a lecture like this can give. I mean, I'll try, I'll take a crack at it, uh, and hopefully a lot will come out during the Q&A time where we can offer clarification. But uh, it is one of those things where kind of like to lead up to this in a series, but bam, this is the first one, uh, the first talk that I've got to give to you all. So uh, we'll try to put some things in perspective about these, uh, some cha these challenging topics of Old Testament ethical issues. Uh, we just heard a quotation from Richard Dawkins. And this, this is something else he said about the Old Testament or the, the, the God of the Hebrew Bible. He says, what makes my jaw drop is that people today should base their lives on such an appalling role model as Yahweh, the, the Hebrew uh, name for God, uh, the, God of the, uh, the God of Israel. And even worse, that they should bossily try to force that same evil monster, hence the title of the book, um, uh, whether fact or fiction, on the rest of us. And then he talks about the ubiquitous weirdness of the Bible, and he lists biblical characters lying and engaging in incestuous relations and committing adultery and so forth. And, and so there's been a lot of criticism launched at the God of the Old Testament, uh, and a lot of the new atheists, uh, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, uh, have really uh, been very bold and outspoken about these things, especially since September 11th. Now, before I get into talking about some of these Old Testament ethical challenges, kind of laying the groundwork for a clear understanding of these things, uh, bear with me as I point out a little bit of hypocrisy in our friend Richard Dawkins. He says something, uh, you know, I think there's something quite humorous about Richard Dawkins and how he handles this whole thing about the Old Testament God. So let me first talk about his worldview, naturalism, and the problem of evil. 
which is really what this, uh, the challenge of the Old Testament uh, amounts to, the problem of evil. I would argue that many critics of the Old Testament do not have an intellectual leg to stand on when they bring up the problem of evil against God because it's hard to make sense out of evil in a purely naturalistic world. Let me quote Richard Dawkins himself to give a little perspective. This is what he says in his book, The River Out of Eden. He says, if the universe were just electrons and selfish genes, meaningless tragedies are exactly what we should expect, along with equally meaningless good fortune. Such a universe would be neither evil nor good in intention. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. You catch that? Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. This is the world of the naturalist. This is the world of Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, who clings to science, says that science has no methods for deciding what is ethical. That is a matter for individuals and for society. Science cannot tell you, for example, whether abortion is wrong. So my question is, what is all this talk from Dawkins about God being a moral monster? If this is the kind of world that Richard Dawkins is advocating, then it seems that any practice mentioned in the Bible would be neither right or wrong. It's just a matter of blind, pitiless indifference. I asked Richard Dawkins about this myself. He came to Florida, which is where I'm from. It's uh, warmer down here, or war uh, warmer down there than it is here, but I like the fact that you've got real trees up here. Uh, <laughs> it's always great to come back north. But when Richard Dawkins came to the land of no trees in Fort Lauderdale, uh, at Nova Southeastern last spring, I heard him speak, and I was the first one up at the microphone during the Q&A time. And this is the question that I asked him. I said, uh, Professor Dawkins, in your book, River Out of Eden, you say that we are all dancing to the music of our DNA. So my question to you would be, if we are simply dancing to the music of our DNA. How can the naturalist, the person who believes that there is nature and nothing more, how can the naturalist claim to have any rational superiority over the theist because the same blind material deterministic forces that are at work in producing the theist's beliefs are the same blind forces that are at work in producing the naturalist's beliefs. So it seems to me that there is no basis for saying that the naturalist is more rational than the theist. Now, leave it to Richard Dawkins. He's very good with rhetoric, and he's got a British accent, so he's got to be believable, you know? <laughs> so Richard Dawkins says, well, I suppose that science just works. And then when he went on to say that science flies rockets to the moon. Religion flies planes into buildings. And the crowd just roared, yeah! They were clapping for him, and I thought, of course, couldn't come back after that. There's the next person in line to ask the question. But of course, Richard Dawkins knows better, and I'll tell you why. But if that's the case, that we're just dancing to the music of our DNA, one, Richard Dawkins' own response was just his own dancing to his DNA. What the scientists who fly rocks to the moon were doing were just dancing to their DNA. In fact, it was actually the Nazis who first came up with rockets, but 
you know, we don't want to talk about that. Thank you, sir. It's becoming a dry lecture, so uh, I will. There we go. Thank you. And also, the uh, jihadists who flew planes into buildings were also dancing to the music of their DNA. In an interview with Justin Brierley in pre Premier Radio uh, in the UK, Richard Dawkins was pressed on this very point. And Justin Brierley asked Richard Dawkins, he said, if you believe that we are simply the products of these blind material forces, then your belief that rape is wrong is nothing more than a biological adaptation just like the adaptation of our having five fingers on our hands rather than six. And Richard Dawkins had to admit, yeah, I guess you're right. It's not a matter of rationality. It's just a matter of survival and reproduction. So any criticisms against God's acts of judgment or for that matter, any acts of racism, ethnocentrism, terrorism, would simply be arbitrary. When we're talking about this whole idea of adaptability and so forth, it's very interesting that uh, what Patricia Churchland, the philosopher at San Diego, uh, University of uh, California at San Diego says, she said, that simply as biological beings, we are not hardwired to seek the truth. We are not hardwired to be rational. Rather, we're fundamentally hardwired by deterministic, materialistic forces to survive. What she calls the four Fs, fighting, feeding, fleeing, and reproducing. Now this argument that is being used from evil against belief in God, I think is the strongest emotional argument. That this is indeed the argument that I think is the strongest one that say the atheist has in her arsenal. But I would say if you get rid of God, I don't know how you make sense of evil. Theism is at least better positioned to make moral judgments than naturalism. In fact, this is the experience of C.S. Lewis, the noted Christian writer, when he was an atheist. This is what he writes about his perspective as an atheist. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? If the whole show was bad and senseless from A to Z, or as the Brits say, A to Z, so to speak, why did I, who was supposed to be part of the show, find myself in such violent reaction against it? Thus, in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely my idea of justice, was full of sense. You see, Lewis realized that evil is a departure from the way that things ought to be. This assumes a kind of design plan. If nature is all there is, why ought things to be any different than they are? How do we move from is to ought? And this is the same problem that is found in many Eastern religious and philosophical traditions. For example, the Advaita Vedanta, or non-dualistic version of Hinduism, in which evil is just an illusion. If you believe that there is any distinction between the soul, Atman, and God, this, uh, this pure consciousness, the ultimate reality, Brahman, by the way, when you put them together, Atman and Brahman, you get Batman. <laughs> just kidding. But if you believe that there is any sort of distinction between good and evil, you are living in a world of illusion or maya. 
there is no good or evil. And this is a common theme in many of these schools uh, of, uh, you know, in the East. In fact, Arthur Kessler, in his book, The Lotus and the Robot, just after the Second World War, he tells about going East to Japan. He went to a place called the International House of Tokyo. I hot, not I hop. <laughs> and he was asked about the problem of good and evil, the Zen Buddhist scholar there. And this Zen Buddhist scholar, when he was asked about Hitler and the gas chambers in these concentration camps, the, the Zen Buddhist scholar said, that was very silly of Hitler. When Arthur Kessler pressed him, he said, just silly and not evil. The Zen Buddhist scholar said, evil is a Christian invention, and that these terms are only relative terms. Well, again, if you get rid of a personal creator, a good personal creator, then the denials about good and evil by Dawkins or by the IHOT scholar aren't very surprising. To get rid of God, as I said, however, because of evil only multiplies your problems. I think a question for each of us to ask tonight is, how do I account for evil in this world? If I believe that there are genuine evils and that, say, human beings have dignity and worth and rights and personal responsibility, how could that come about if we are simply the products of selfish genes and electrons and other material forces beyond our control? Well, this is the kind of context that we ought to be discussing this uh, topic of Old Testament ethical concerns in. Because I find that as people get up to criticize, I find that their worldview does not actually have the metaphysical equipment to actually address the problem of evil. So in a sense, their criticism only is parasitic on a viewpoint that does have the resources for affirming the existence of good and it's, in a sense, counterfeit or the parasite that lives off of uh, the, the goodness, uh, the standard of goodness, uh, namely evil. So as we go into our criticism, so to speak, or in the, our investigation, and as you, in a sense, ask the questions about, well, what about this or what about this or the God of the Old Testament, it's important for us to ask, well, how do I make sense of the evil that exists in the world? Why should things be any different than the way that they are? Where does that design plan come from, if I really believe that? All right, that's part one. Let's get to the topic that uh, you have been, uh, that has been advertised. And uh, by the way, I'll be speaking on the problem of evil tomorrow, and I think you'll hear uh, that's been announced or it's in the uh, publications as to where uh, we're meeting and so forth, but, uh, but I'll be speaking in more detail on the problem of evil tomorrow, so would certainly welcome your further interaction there. But let me give you now some advice on navigating the Hebrew scriptures, or as Christians call it, the Old Testament. In the first place, it's important for us to remember that Israel's theocratic status, that is, a state ruled or directed by God, was unique and non-universalizable. Now, lots of criticisms assume that if something was true for ancient Israel, then therefore it must be true and relevant for all nations. Now, this is what Richard Dawkins says. He's concerned about those who would bossily try to force the same evil monster, whether fact or fiction, on the rest of us. Well, again, this assumes that what was taking place, the covenant that God made with Israel, was something that was to apply to all nations as well. But it's very interesting that when God, for example, brings judgment to nations, it's not as though God is judging them for breaking the laws of Moses or something like that. Not at all. God brings judgment. God is angered when, for example, there are peoples who rip open pregnant women to expand their borders, when they are betraying a people with whom they've made a treaty, a vulnerable group of exiles and betraying them into the hands of their enemies, when they take advantage of the poor and those who cannot fend for themselves. In fact, 
God himself judges his own people. It's not as though God is angry only with nations when they violate fundamental moral standards, but his own people for engaging in cor the corrupt practices that their neighbors do. This theocracy or this God rule is something that was intended to be temporary and not a permanent arrangement for all nations then or now. That's the first point. A second point to keep in mind as we try to navigate the Old Testament scriptures is this. Avoid using misleading statements like taking the Bible literally. Now, I'm not sure what that means uh, in the first place. We should not always take the Bible literally. There are some statements like when the Psalms talk about the, uh, the trees of the fields clapping their hands, uh, don't take that literally. It wasn't intended to be taken literally. Actually, what we should do is try to take the Bible as best we can literarily. That is, the Bible is full of different genres or types of literature, apocalyptic, parables, historical narrative, you know, uh, poetry. There's, there are all types of different, uh, different literatures within the Bible. And so we take each of those literatures according to the way that they were intended to be interpreted. And it's not a one-size-fits-all model. But yet a lot of times people get into trouble when they use that term, well, you're not taking the Bible literally. I was doing a, uh, a radio debate. You can, if you're interested, you can look up my website, paulcopan.com, and there's a, it's a debate with Norman Backrack, who is the head of the Humanist Society in London. And we were talking about the topic of war texts in the Old Testament. Text where it looks like there is you know, utter destruction, that no survivors are left in this warfare. And so Norman Backrick says, look, when I read that literally, it just seems to be very straightforward that there were no survivors left. I said, well, it's very interesting that you're taking the, the, the text literally where it says, leave alive nothing that breathes, but then you seem to ignore the literal statement that there are lots of survivors who are left. In ancient Near East war texts, it was very common to use exaggeration or hyperbole. That there was not, a, you know, in fact, you, we could read some war texts from the ancient Near East where there was a, somebody who eked out a victory, just barely won. And he said, didn't leave any survivors, all gone. That's the kind of language that is being used. That's just part of the genre or the type of literature. Everyone understood. It's kind of like when we say, oh, pff, Purdue just totally annihilated Indiana. <laughs> yeah. We, well, I mean, we don't take that literally. We understand that there is a certain context for that. And this is what is going on. It's interesting that wherever you read, no survivors left or anything like that, it's actually that kind of language. We see lots of survivors in the books of Joshua and Judges and elsewhere, where it seems like, oh, there's you know, total massacre. No, it's actually very, you see lots of survivors on the next page. For example, in, uh, you know, in, in Joshua 11 and 14, we read that there are no Anakim, the sons of Anak, left. And then we read a few chapters later that Caleb is going to go fight against the Anakites. Well, were they all wiped out or, or not? What are you going to take literally? Well, that's just the nature of these kinds of war texts. And I, I would argue further, and we can get into this during the Q&A time too, I don't want to belabor this issue, um, but these were, as archaeologist and Egyptologist Kenneth Kitchen says, these, the warfare was more like disabling raids, which were targeting cities, which really, they were, they were not... You know, there, these were cities of non-civilians. Non it was basically combatants, political, and military leaders uh, who were there, like in a place like Jericho. Uh, you know, you might have a tavern keeper like Rahab, but basically these were the strongholds or the citadels that were guarding the hill country. So these were the places where, where things would be, in a sense, disabled. There were, there were military encounters rather than, uh, than referring to, uh, you know, uh, civilian populations. But we can get into that a little later. But the point here is, is that be careful about this line, taking the Bible literally. That's often uh, terribly uh, abused, and it's important to see that in context. 
Another point to keep in mind when reading in the Old Testament is be, be careful about moving from is to ought. There are a lot of biblical characters and their actions, people like David, Solomon, Gideon, who are a mixed moral bag, sometimes like Greek tragic figures. And the Old Testament writers, people who are chronicling this, are actually deconstructing figures like Gideon and Solomon to show how exactly unfit for leadership they are. So there are subtle criticisms of these very characters, despite the fact that, you know, I think many people will, you know, highlight them as only good, but no, actually the biblical writers, as they're recounting in these historical narratives, they're actually, in a sense, dismantling them and removing their credibility because of how they're actually conducting themselves. So we have to ask the question, is, you know, is this being described or is it being prescribed? And if it's being prescribed, is it something that is being prescribed for all times and so forth? That's another issue. Another point, don't assume an ideal ethic in, you know, across the board in the Old Testament. In the beginning of the Old Testament, in Genesis 1 and 2, we do see ideals spelled out. All human beings are being made in the image of God. They have dignity and worth that man and woman are seen as equals. But the conditions move away from these ideals. Warfare becomes a way of life. Patriarchal societies develop. Social structures become corrupted. And so a lot of the Old Testament legislation takes into account these fallen structures and, in a sense, works with them. God meeting the people part way um, to, you know, God puts up with some moral and social junk without glorifying it or idealizing it. In fact, this is exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 19.8 where he's talking about Mosaic legislation that Moses permitted certain things, not because they were ideal, but because of the hardness of human hearts. That this is how a lot of the Old Testament legislation is to be understood. It's not because this is the ideal. It's not because God is working with perfect people, but rather there's a lot of corruption, a lot of crookedness within the people, and the first step to moving in the right direction is actually helping them to see how crooked they actually are. So God's, you know, so these laws are given more often to restrain and regulate rather than to idealize. And also the Old Testament writers take for granted that this is a law that is going to be transcended. It's not something that is going to remain this way, but there's a, a look forward to a new covenant, a new agreement, so to speak, uh, between God and human beings that is going to surpass an inferior arrangement uh, that we see in the Old Testament. Another point to keep in mind, and it's often overlooked, is this, that we see marked moral improvements in the Hebrew Bible in contrast with other ancient Near East societies. For example, in ancient Near Eastern societies, uh, in, in these ancient Near East law codes, we, we see that property crimes take center stage. But biblical laws actually highlight the value of human beings, the sacredness of human life, the value of the family, and so forth. Also, law codes like that of Hammurabi in Babylon allowed for the punishment of a perpetrator's family, the family, the family members, rather than punishment of the perpetrator himself. So if a builder builds a building and it collapses, well, you, know, you can take it out on the builder's wife, you know, allowing her to be raped, perhaps. Whereas in the Old Testament, those who were guilty of wrongdoing or negligence were to be punished, not the spouse or the children. There's a standard reference work when it comes to biblical studies, and it's called the Anchor Bible Dictionary. And the person writing on uh, the question of, quote, slavery in the Old Testament, um, uh, Muhammad Dandamayev, says that we have in the Bible the first appeals in world literature to treat slaves, or I would to say better, servants, uh, as human beings for their own sakes, and not just in the interest of their masters. Another scholar, Christopher Wright, observes, he says, the slave or the servant was given human and legal rights unheard of in contemporary societies in the ancient Near East. In fact, Christopher Wright, this uh, Old Testament scholar, lists uh, a number of the Old Testament law's compassionate drift themes. He talks about how there are categories where you see a warm ethic that really is bubbling under the surface and that a lot of people simply overlook. These are some of the things that he lists. 
protection for the weak, especially those who lack the natural protection of family and land, namely widows and orphans and immigrants or resident aliens. Justice for the poor, impartiality in the courts, generosity at harvest time and in general economic life. Respect for persons and property, even of an enemy. Sensitivity to the dignity, even of the debtor. Special care for strangers and immigrants. Considerable treatment for the disabled. Prompt payment of wages earned by hired labor. Sensitivity over articles taken in pledge, like a cloak, you give it back to the person. Considering Consideration for people in early marriage or in bereavement, even care for animals, domestic and wild, and even for fruit trees. It would be well worth pausing, he says, with the Bible to read through the passages in a footnote uh, to feel the warm heartbeat of all this material. Another point to keep in mind, some terms in the Old Testament should not be interpreted by modern usage. Let me just give you a couple of examples here. The term slavery, we read about that in the Old Testament. In fact, sometimes, you know, if a father sells his daughter and so forth, what? What's going on here? You know, it looks very cruel, looks very, uh, you know, uh, inhuman even. But this is actually an unfortunate translation. For one thing, in Israel, if you were utterly destitute, you sold yourself and you parceled your family out to relatives in your kinship group. You know, the tribes were established uh, in Israel, the 12 tribes were established according to clans. So you were close to your relatives in these uh, tribal lands. And so what you would do is you would parcel them out to other people because you didn't, you had to, you know, you had a bad a couple of years of crops, uh, had to sell everything, had nowhere else to go, had nobody to provide for your family. Well, this is one way to do it. You had you know, family living with, uh, you know, t most likely clans people, relatives, and staying under their roof. They had food provided for them, clothing provided for them, and there was a term, a cap set on how long they could be kept. Uh, in the house, unless they voluntarily committed themselves to lifelong servitude. It's kind of like indentured servitude. When people came over to the New World from uh, Britain, for example, to pay for their passage, they'd work for a certain number of years as indentured servants here in the New World to pay off their passage. And then when they were done with paying off their debt, then they were back to where they stood in society without having that debt operating as normal citizens. That was how it operated in ancient Israel. So, you know, a lot of times when we think, you know, we read slavery, uh, don't think antebellum, you know, the pre-Civil War type of slavery. That is a gross distortion of what is actually taking place in, uh, in, in the Old Testament. Another phrase that's, uh, that's commonly misunderstood is the passage, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Sounds like, man, they're really getting gross and, you know, you're going to have to gouge an eye out for an eye. Well, actually, wherever you read this passage in the Old Testament, it's always dealing with monetary transactions and not dealing with taking out an eye if you've gouged out another person's eye. Um, but, uh, but you have, for example, the Old Test respected Old Testament scholar Brevard Child says, this principle, also called lex talionis, eye for an eye, uh, marked an important advance and was far from being a vestige from a primitive age. Another point as we review making sense of the Old Testament and putting it in context. Another consideration is that we need to remember God's moral authority over his creatures, which means that our own lives can't be seen in terms of business as usual. Let me read to you a quotation from Thomas Nagel, who is an atheist philosopher at New York University. He said something very revealing in his book called The Last Word. He says, as an atheist, in speaking of the fear of religion, I don't mean to refer to the entirely reasonable hostility towards certain established religions and religious institutions in virtue of their objectionable moral doctrines, social policies, and political influence, nor am I referring to the association of many religious beliefs with superstition and the acceptance of evident empirical falsehoods. I am talking about something much deeper namely the fear of religion itself. I speak from experience. 
being strongly subject to this fear myself. Listen to this. I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. Let me repeat that. I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Now here we have someone who admits to having what he calls a cosmic authority problem. Thomas Nagel doesn't want there to be a God. You know, if God exists, then this means that it can't be operating by my own agenda. It's going to be, be, mean operating by another's agenda. It's going to be operating by the God who designed me to live in a certain way. And so here, as we're dealing with the cosmic authority problem, I think it's important for us to consider this. You know, Paul Moser, a philosopher at uh, University of Loyola in Chicago, says it would be a strange, defective God who didn't pose a serious cosmic authority problem for humans. Part of the status of being God, after all, is that God has a unique authority or lordship over humans. Since we humans aren't God, the true God would have authority over us and would seek to correct our profoundly selfish ways. Yes, you're selfish, and so am I. And that self-centeredness, are we going to live in that? C.S. Lewis said in, the, he said, in the end, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. And yes, we can look at some of the things in the Old Testament. There's a certain harshness. There's a, you know, there's a, a serious moral authority that we're talking about here. And we see a God who gets angry at certain things that take place, things that destroy, things that ruin, things that dehumanize. The Yale theologian Miroslav Volf was born in Croatia. And he lived through the nightmare years of ethnic strife in the former Yugoslavia. He used to think that having a God who was angry was somehow low, that, that anger was beneath God. But he came to realize that his view of God had actually been too low, had been inferior. And so this is what he writes about his own experience. He says, I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love and loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out, some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandfatherly fashion? By refusing to condemn the bloodbath, but instead affirming the perpetrators' basic goodness? Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. A final point, and then we'll go to our question and answer time. When we read in the New Testament, we read about how Jesus puts the Old Testament together, how he makes it all fit in terms of those sacrifices that were actually pointing to the sacrifice that Jesus himself would become 
to usher in a new creation, that God steps into a world, steps into an evil world, faces suffering, injustice, Jesus dying naked on a cross to rescue humanity, to bring about a new creation, to bring about a reconciliation between God and human beings. And as he puts these things together, that has a ripple effect on those who are his followers. This is exactly what we see going on in the first centuries, that without political power, Christians, through acts of love and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, bring about a remarkable transformation in the Roman Empire without lifting a sword, without any sort of military uprising, but that there is a transformation that takes place in the tenor of the Roman world. In fact, there is a, uh, a series done, uh, a PBS series, I believe, done on Rome itself. And one of the persons who was being interviewed, one of the scholars, not a Christian, but he said the diff Rome was brutal, barbaric, and what actually brought about a transformation, he said, was the Judeo-Christian ethic. Now, this is something that I think is very, uh, very interesting. Uh, there is a noted atheist in Europe, Jürgen Habermas, who is probably the leading philosopher in Europe. And this is what he writes. He's, you know, again, he's a dyed-in-the-wool atheist. But this is what he has to say about the shaping effect of the God of the Bible. He says this, he says, Christianity has functioned for the normative self-understanding of modernity as more than just a precursor or a catalyst. Get this, egalitarian universalism from which sprang the idea of freedom and a social solidarity of an autonomous conduct of life and emancipation, the individual morality of conscious, conscience, human rights and democracy is the direct heir to the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. This legacy, substantially unchanged, has been the object of continual critical appro appropriation and reinterpretation. To this day, there is no alternative to it. And in light of current challenges of post-national constellation, we continue to draw on the substance of this heritage. Everything else is just idle, postmodern talk. All of those rights and values this atheist, Jürgen Habermas, says are the direct result of the Judeo-Christian ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. And this is certainly well documented. I can get into more details if you want in the uh, Q&A time. Uh, let me read one uh, Chinese scholar who is speaking to, a group, to an American audience. This is documented by, the time, uh, uh, by a Time uh, magazine uh, correspondent, David Aikman. And he says that this Chinese scholar who is lecturing to these Americans was saying, one of the things that we were asked to look into was what accounted for the success, in fact, of the preeminence of the West over all the world. He said, we studied everything that we could from the historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we had. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on your economic system. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West has been so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. And again, this is from a Chinese, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences scholar who is, uh, who is acknowledging this, the premier research academy in China. Let me give a final quotation here. As I said, Jesus putting the Old Testament into perspective and bringing it to fulfillment. A well-known pastor and, and uh, you know, uh, someone who really is thoughtful about his, uh, about his faith is uh, Tim Keller. If you haven't read any of his books, would encourage you to. He's written a book called The Reason for God uh, and would, uh, would certainly encourage you to, to take a look at that. But he, this is what he says. He says, if your fundamental, your ultimate basic, is a man dying on the cross for his enemies, if the very heart of your self-image and your religion is the man praying for his enemies as he died for them, sacrificing for them, loving them, if that sinks into your heart of hearts, it's going to produce the kind of life 
that the early Christians produced, the most inclusive possible life out of the most exclusive possible claim. And that is that this is the truth. But what is the truth? The truth is God becoming weak, loving, and dying for the people who opposed him, dying, forgiving them. Those are some considerations as we try to work through some of the issues in the Old Testament. Now, are there issues? Are there challenges? Are there questions? No doubt about it. But when it comes to putting things in their proper perspective, when it comes to making sense out of the murkiness as well as the evils that we see, out of the degradation of people, out of the suffering in this world, do we want to deny that as an illusion or say that there is at bottom nothing but just blind, pitiless indifference? Or is there a God who is there? A God who is a moral authority. A God who, though a moral authority, actually knows what is best for us, who has designed us to function in a certain way, that we find our ultimate significance and security by being rightly connected to him. The theologian Augustine said, you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Thank you.